The police are vital forces in maintaining social safety and stability and have always been trusted and respected by various sectors of society. Many police officers have made tremendous sacrifices to protect public safety. However, if individuals with sinister intentions make it into the police force and start to commit crimes using their knowledge and power, the damage they can cause is quite astonishing. The real case we are going to talk about today is the story of a police officer. The incident took place on January 11, 1982. A 23-year-old actress named Robin Bishop was driving on Interstate 15. She had just finished a successful audition in Hollywood. She was over the moon and was preparing to return to her home in Nevada so she could pack up and move to Hollywood to start her glamorous life. The interstate journey would take three hours, so before getting on the highway, she stopped in a town called Barstow for a break. She refueled her car and then ate at a restaurant. It was at this moment that a pair of predatory eyes in the crowd fixed on her. The person was George Gwaltney, a respected and beloved police officer in the local community. 41-year-old George had been working in the police force for 10 years. He was diligent, helpful, well-liked by his colleagues and very friendly and enthusiastic towards the local residents. He often organized activities for the children in the local communities, helped them with problems in their daily lives, and over time, he became a hero in the eyes of the locals, earning respect and admiration from everyone. He consistently won the title of the best police officer of the year. George also had a happy family and was raising five children with his wife, but beneath his glamorous appearance lay a rotten and depraved soul. Over the years, he had been taking advantage of his position to stop single female drivers he was interested in on the highway, falsely accusing them of speeding, threatening to revoke their driver's licenses, and then giving these women two options, either pay a hefty fine or have sex with him. Over the years, at least 11 women became victims of his perverted crimes. Of course, he would let these victims go afterward, knowing that with his well-established local reputation, even if these women were to accuse him, no one would believe them. After seeing the good-looking Robin that day, George's evil desires stirred once again. He subtly noted down Robin's car features and license plate number. Knowing that the license plate was from Nevada, he guessed that Robin would soon be taking Interstate 15. Following Robin's car now would attract too much attention, so George, as an experienced criminal, decided to let Robin go for now and pursue her later. Leaving the restaurant, George drove the police car pretending to patrol the neighborhood. That's when he spotted a boy named Preston walking home. Since he was good friends with the boy's parents, he warmly invited him into the car, drove him home, and left after greeting the boy's parents. All his actions were not out of goodwill, but as a precaution. In case Robin later accused him, this boy could serve as his alibi. With everything in place, George stepped on the gas onto Interstate 15. The Intercontinental Highway was deserted at night, and after catching up to Robin's car, George followed for a while until he reached a dark stretch without any streetlights. Making sure there were no other vehicles around, he pulled the siren, forcing Robin to stop. Sure enough, using the threat of revoking her license, George intimidated the 23-year-old woman into complying so she could keep her license. The corrupt cop then took Robin to his police car, handcuffed her in the back, drove a few miles away to a secluded stretch of the road, and sexually assaulted her in the car. After finishing, he brought the victim back to the Intercontinental Highway. Not far from Robin's car, he removed the handcuffs, allowing her to walk back to her vehicle and leave. Robin sat on the ground, starting to put on the boots that had been taken off earlier when something unexpected happened. A police car passed by, and the officer inside flashed the torch at George standing by the road. This was a typical way for police officers to acknowledge each other when meeting on the road. 
However, this moment caught George off guard. He was unsure if the officer recognized him. If he did, and Robin pressed charges later, the officer would be a witness. To eliminate the potential risk in one go, George had to silence her. So, while Robin was still putting on her shoes, he took out his gun and shot the girl in the back of the head. A young, beautiful life vanished, and George went from being a rapist to a murderer. A few minutes later, the police headquarters radio crackled with George's nervous voice. He reported finding an unmanned car on Highway 15. Upon inspection, he discovered a female body nearby and suspected it to be a suicide. Before the police arrived, George had frantically searched for the bullet he fired but couldn't find anything. That's because the bullet had pierced Robin's brain and embedded in her maxilla bone, making it impossible to remove without surgical intervention. When the other officers arrived, it started to rain. The forensic expert scolded George for contaminating the scene with his footprints, potentially destroying crucial evidence, which was a novice mistake for a seasoned police officer. After examining Robin's body, the police were startled to find bruising on her wrists consistent with handcuff marks, matching those produced by the handcuffs police used. Robin's wallet still contained cash and her driver's license, with the driver's license placed on top. This indicated that the last time Robin took out her wallet, it was probably to show the license to someone. There were no signs of theft or robbery on Robin's car parked nearby, with the keys still inserted. Combining all the evidence at the scene, the police came to a troubling initial conclusion that there was likely involvement of a police officer or someone impersonating one in this crime. However, all the police present at the scene were friends of George and never suspected this diligent cop. After leaving the scene, George began frantically covering up his crime. He sent the uniform he was wearing for thorough cleaning and took the gun holster to a specialized shop for cleaning, dyeing and stitching. He hoped to eliminate any possible blood spatter on him through these measures. George knew that the coroner would definitely find the bullet lodged in Robin's skull. By comparing the rifling marks, he wouldn't be able to get away with it. So, he disassembled his service weapon with tools, discarded the barrel and some other parts, and then went to a local gun shop to buy a new barrel to replace it. Unfortunately, the gun shop didn't have it in stock at that time, and it was only available for pre-order with a waiting period for restocking. George had no choice but to hide the gun frame in his pickup truck. While George was nervously trying to cover up his crime, the autopsy on Robin's body was also being carried out meticulously. The coroner confirmed that the bruise on Robin's wrist was caused by police handcuffs, and they also retrieved a bullet from her maxilla bone matching the caliber of a police firearm, but of a different brand. The standard bullets issued by the police department were Remington, but the bullet found was from Smith & Wesson. Additionally, semen was found on Robin's body and jeans, indicating sexual activity within 24 hours of her death, yet there were no signs of struggle, suggesting this was not a typical case of rape. All these findings pointed to the murder being committed by a police officer or someone disguised as one. The autopsy report was delivered to the sheriff's office the day after the incident. Consequently, the police chief immediately ordered all police officers on duty on the night of January 11, 1982, to surrender their issued firearms for rifling comparison. By the afternoon, all police firearms were collected, except for George's gun. At this point, George was extremely anxious. He had hoped that the autopsy results would be delayed so that he could have time to buy a new gun barrel to deceive the investigation. However, now, he could only rely on lying to get through the crisis. That evening, two detectives arrived at George's house, reminding him that he might have forgotten to turn in his gun and hoped that he could hand over the gun for them to take back. Initially, George handed over a gun, 
but the detectives immediately pointed out that it was not a police-issued one. George, feeling helpless, claimed that his gun had been stolen. George's demeanor raised suspicion among the detectives. Although they did not believe that he was the culprit, his behavior and responses were too suspicious. Therefore, they asked George to accompany them back to the police station to give a statement about the lost gun and to recount the events of the night he found Robin's body. According to George's account, after dinner on the 11th, he let a boy named Preston get into his car nearby, then he dropped the boy off at home at 8.40 p.m. At 8.50 p.m. he got on the interstate highway, and at 9.15 p.m. he found Robin's abandoned car on the side of the road. After looking around for a while, he discovered Robin's body at 9.24 p.m. To increase his credibility, George voluntarily requested a polygraph test, which he successfully passed. Things were looking up for George as he managed to deceive the lie detector smoothly. His colleagues only expressed regret for his lost gun and no one suspected him as the killer. As long as he could delay for a few more days, he would be able to purchase a new barrel, permanently removing any suspicion. However, that same day, the overconfident George made a big mistake. In order to show that he had nothing to hide, he agreed to let the police search his home. The diligent police officers found a badly damaged frame of a revolver under the floor mat of his pickup truck. Even though the barrel and many parts were missing, the serial number was still visible. Upon comparison, the police confirmed it was the police-issued firearm assigned to George. The police officers realized that he had only removed the barrel for one reason, to eliminate evidence related to the murder of Robin. Consequently, on January 14, 1982, George was arrested on charges of rape and first-degree murder. When news of this incident broke, the community was shocked. Many residents gathered at the police station to protest, claiming that they must have arrested the wrong person. It wasn't just ordinary residents. Even many police officers, upon hearing the news, were overcome with sadness and broke into tears. They believed that something must have gone wrong. Despite the disbelief in their colleague being the murderer, the police conducted a more thorough search of George's belongings. In the garage, they discovered some tools, which had many fresh metal fragments on them. This indicated that George might have used these tools to disassemble his own gun. After comparison, they found numerous dents and scratches on the gun frame that were similar to the marks these tools could make. In George's bedroom, the authorities found several boxes of handgun bullets. Although most of them were Remington brand, there was also a box of Smith & Wesson brand, which matched the brand of bullets that killed Robin. During the search of George's police car and clothes, the police were very disappointed because he had already done a thorough vacuuming and cleaning, so there was no fiber evidence to prove that Robin had been in the car. However, investigators found several semen stains on the back seat of the car, indicating that sexual activity had taken place in the vehicle. Although DNA testing technology did not exist in 1982, the technique of determining blood types was already well established. The final conclusion was that the semen blood type on the car seat matched those of Robin, as well as George's own blood type. There was another compelling piece of evidence, which was the testimony of the police officer who passed by that evening. The officer recalled seeing a police car parked on the side of the road. As he drove past, he flashed his flashlight to greet them and saw the woman alive at that time. However, he did not get a clear look at the face of the officer standing beside her. Nevertheless, based on the police deployment records, only George and that officer were patrolling on Interstate 15 that night. With this evidence, the investigators believed they had sufficient proof and were preparing to deliver the deserved punishment to George in court. The trial of George began on October 4, 1982. The prosecution presented a large amount of physical evidence, along with testimony from forensic and evidence experts, claiming all circumstantial evidence 
pointed to George as the killer of Robin. However, George maintained his innocence throughout the trial. His defense lawyer refuted all the evidence. From his perspective, he suggested that George may have been targeted by someone resentful of his career success, insinuating that within the police force there was a bad apple who stole George's gun, tampered with it, then put it back, and framed the dedicated officer for the crime. The prosecution's claim that George left traces on the gun rack with his tool was deemed unsubstantiated. Traces could only be considered similar and could not be proven to have been caused by the same tool. Even if the blood type found in Robin's semen matched George's blood type found in the back seat of the police car, it did not indicate it was George himself. There were just too many people with the same blood type. Furthermore, the lawyer pointed out that George dropped Preston off at home at 8.40 p.m. that evening and got on the highway at 8.50 p.m. If George was the murderer, he would have had less than 20 minutes to catch up with, threaten, abduct, rape, and kill the victim, which is simply impossible. In the final argument, the defense lawyer stated that because the handgun's barrel was missing, even though the police suspected George, they could no longer prove that the bullet killing Robin was fired from this gun. Therefore, the damaged gun could not be used as evidence to charge George. We can see that the defense lawyer's arguments showed a strong trace of sophistry. Although he pointed out that all the evidence could have another explanation, can such a coincidence really exist? It depended on which side of the argument the jury ultimately believed. To be honest, if an ordinary person was standing at the defendant's dock at that time, the jury would probably convict him considering the amount of evidence. However, facing George, a senior police officer with a good reputation, they hesitated. In the end, the jury announced George as not guilty with a verdict of eight votes of not guilty and four votes of guilty. Both the prosecution and Robin's family were shocked. They couldn't believe that despite presenting so much evidence, they still lost the case. Several jurors who voted not guilty said that based on the evidence, they were willing to believe that George was guilty. However, faced with a police officer with such a good reputation, they found it emotionally challenging to convict without stronger, irrefutable evidence. George's carefully cultivated image as a good police officer over the past 10 years proved to be very handy. Unwilling to give up, the prosecution requested a retrial. In February 1983, the second trial against George began in the State High Court. This time, in addition to previous evidence, the prosecution brought in several women who George had allegedly assaulted in the past to testify against him. One woman testified that George had pulled her over near the location where Robin was murdered and sexually assaulted her on a similar side road. However, the judge quickly dismissed these women's testimonies, deeming them as willingly offering George sexual bribes. Without new compelling testimonies, the prosecution failed once again. Ultimately, the jury voted 7 to 5 in favor of acquitting George, to make matters worse, the court considered any future retrial requests from the prosecution as harassment against a law-abiding citizen. The judge permanently dismissed the case, leading to the prosecution's complete defeat. George strutted out of the courtroom, wearing a smug smile on his face, convinced that he had finally escaped legal repercussions forever. However, an unexpected organization entered the scene, the FBI. Due to police involvement, the FBI had been monitoring the case from the start. With all the evidence pointing towards George as the perpetrator and seeing the district attorney fail, they decided to take matters into their own hands to weed out the corruption within law enforcement. Despite the state court's verdict of George's innocence of the murder charge, the FBI couldn't prosecute him on that basis. But that didn't stop them. They formulated a new strategy by alleging that George, as a public official, had violated Robin's civil rights, specifically the rights to life and liberty. 
they proceeded to prosecute him in federal court on charges of civil rights violations, marking the first instance in American history of such charges being brought against an individual. Recognizing George's adeptness at deception, the FBI understood that only irrefutable and compelling evidence could truly pin him down. So they mobilized elite personnel and invested a large amount of funds to conduct a more in-depth investigation of the existing evidence. They started with the bullets. Although George's gun was missing its barrel and couldn't undergo ballistic testing, the investigators believed that the bullets themselves were the key evidence. Bullets are produced by manufacturers in batches and there are subtle differences in lead content and composition between each batch. Therefore, the FBI placed the bullets found in Robin's head and the Smith & Wesson bullets found in George's home into a nuclear reactor and observed the radiation ripples produced by the lead inside them after being bombarded by neutrons, ultimately proving that these bullets all came from the same batch. Then the FBI's tool analysis team inspected the tools brought from George's home and found that a tooth on one of the wrenches had broken off. The tiny defect made unique marks left by the wrench, just like fingerprints that are impossible to reproduce. On the disassembled gun frame, they found the same marks, turning it into ironclad evidence that George had personally disassembled the gun. And it didn't end there the FBI made a new discovery in the semen evidence, although it was previously mentioned that the blood type in the semen evidence matched George's blood type, it still couldn't prove that it was residue from his crime. However, after investigating George's medical records, the investigators found that he had undergone a vasectomy in his youth and then had a reversal surgery after marrying. During the reversal surgery, some blood enters the vas deferens, causing about 2.5% of men undergoing this surgery to permanently produce a substance called anti-sperm antibodies in their semen. After testing George's semen and the semen collected from the crime scene, investigators detected a large amount of antibodies. Considering the factor of matching blood types, the possibility of anyone other than George raping Robin is reduced to 1 in 60 million. It can be said that this is the most solid biological evidence besides DNA. Furthermore, the FBI also visited the boy named Preston's home. From the boy's parents, they confirmed that George brought the boy back at 8.10 that evening, not at the claimed time of 8.40. This extended George's window of opportunity from 20 minutes to one hour, effectively refuting his defense lawyer's claim that he didn't have time to commit the crime. Subsequently, the FBI gathered over 150 other pieces of circumstantial evidence. On June 21, 1984, George stood in the defendant's dock in federal court, facing a plethora of irrefutable evidence presented by the FBI. Regardless of his defense lawyer's eloquence, they couldn't turn the tide. In the end, after only one day of deliberation, the grand jury determined that George was guilty of civil rights violations for killing Robin. He was sentenced to the maximum 90 years in prison for this charge. According to the law at that time, he could apply for parole after serving 30 years. However, he did not live to see that day. After 13 years in prison, George died of a heart attack at the age of 56. He never admitted to his crimes. Since his imprisonment, there have been no more incidents of women being abducted and sexually assaulted on that stretch of road. George Gwaltney's case underscores the importance of thorough investigations and accountability, even for those in positions of authority. This story serves as a reminder that justice must be pursued relentlessly to protect the innocent and uphold the integrity of those who serve and protect us. Thank you very much for all your continued support and encouragement. See you in the next video.